Good morning. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the members and future members and guests. We're extremely excited to uh, bring you this important program this morning to talk about our very good water quality in Johnson County and to answer your questions about what this means uh, for the residents and customers of Water One and what you can do for yourself and your community. We have with us two knowledgeable experts in the field of wastewater and water quality. Michael Armstrong, General Manager of Water One, and Elaine Geisel of the Sierra Club and our very own League of Women Voters in Johnson County. Uh, some of you may already know our two guests, but I want to tell you a little bit more about their background. Mike Armstrong has served as Water One's General Manager since 2003. As Chief Executive Officer, he is responsible for the daily administration of the, day of the utilities operations, personnel, and financial affairs. Prior to his role as General Manager, Mike served as Water One's General Counsel and Director of Legal Auditing. He holds a degree in Political Science from Kansas State and a law degree from the University of Kansas. He's also a graduate of Leadership Kansas, Leadership Overland Park, and the Water and Wastewater Leadership Center at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Mr. Armstrong's dedication to the water sector extends beyond his role at Water One. He currently serves on the Kansas Water Authority, a statewide appointed board that provides the leadership to ensure that water policies and programs address the needs of all Kansans. Mr. Armstrong has also served with distinguished tenure on the Missouri River Recovery Implementation Committee <coughs> as an appointee of the Assistant Secretary of the Army and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Through his involvement in this group, he has represented water supply stakeholders on this collaborative regional committee developed to advise the Army Corps of Engineers on operations and management of the Missouri River one of Water One's primary water sources. Mr. Armstrong is also an active member of the American Water Works Association and is former chair of the Water Utility Council of the, uh, the Kansas AWWA section. Our, <coughs> excuse me, uh, our next speaker is Elaine Geisel. She is a marine ecologist by training and has taught biology, geology, microbiology, and environmental science at community colleges in both Kansas and Texas. She is a seasoned, seasonal park naturalist at Erna Miller Park. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like that, and completed K-State Extension Master Naturist, Naturalist program in spring of 2014. Uh, a member of the Sierra Club since 1981, she is currently chair of the local Kansas group. She represents the Kansas chapter of the Sierra Club on the non-game wildlife advisory council to the Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks, and Tourism. Nationally, she is working on marine and water issues and environmental justice. She has, most, uh, she has also volunteered on a range of natural resource issues for the League of Women Voters, most recently as the leader of the LWBKS state study on fracking and water. In 2013, she received the Kansas Association for Conservation and Environmental Education Award for Excellence in conversation, Conservation and Environmental Education for a Community Nonprofit. And please welcome first, Elaine Gosselin. The Sierra Club started as an outing to organization. They took hikes in California. But in the 60s, when the environmental movement really got underway, the Sierra Club became much more conservation-oriented. And we are an advocacy group. We're not just a nonprofit. We will lobby when that is the right course, and we will sue their asses if they break the law. <laughs> what can I say? Um, I think we're ready for the first slide, if you, you want me to gear it up there. Um, I offered to do the, the start here because I want to give you a broad overview of why water is important. I think you all know this, but let's, I'm going to run through some stuff pretty quickly 
and then turn it over to Mike to tell you what they're doing in Johnson County to make sure your water is safe and affordable. But there are issues, and there are issues with source water, which I'm going to focus on. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Do a view or something, yeah, and then we'll yeah. get it. Yeah. No. All right. <laughs> so Sierra Club, as I said, is here. We have a, we have a table back there too, I and mean, you can be a member of both the league yeah. and the Sierra Club. <laughs> And I will tell you, when we go to court, I wear the Sierra Club cap, but when we go to visit our local politicians, I wear my league cap. Works like a charm. Um, so, so what, I mean, let's see, I've got the clicker here. Let's see. And, and I think this is important. I'm sorry about the purple. That's probably not legible. That's our source. But water is not only precious, but it's scarce globally. And I think we need to take the time, because league is involved in and diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. It isn't just about Johnson County. Waterborne diseases are a terrible problem. In underdeveloped countries, sewage and industrial waste, it goes into the waterways untreatable. And it's interesting because we are women. That women suffer first often because they are charged with finding water for the family. And that the walking to get water puts them at risk of rape, of attack, of harm. So water is not a trivial issue. Let's make sure we understand that. And the UN recognized this. And this is fairly old. This is from, I think, 2004 or something. The UN recognized that access to water is a human right and that we shouldn't be putting profit before human rights. It's very important we think about that. I won't read these. I think they're legible even from the back. Um, oops. Hang on one minute. And what it does is making human a uh, human right has implications for management, and that's Mike's department. He's going to talk about that. But it means that we have to make water allocation a priority for human domestic use. And by the way, the league has made human use the highest priority of water. Yay, we're on the right side already. Um, the right recognizes that access to water is also you know, related to food security or income generation environmental protection. But they're not directly protected under this human rights recognition. That right does not cover water for agriculture, grazing, or ecological systems. In Kansas, we have very specific issues. And I think it's important to kind of set that stage here. To, let's focus down to our local region. We have a very complicated system of managing water. It's, it's one thing to talk about Johnson County and having water one and you open your tap and there it is. But in terms of protecting water, there are many state and federal agencies engaged and the league at one time made a proposal that we ought to consolidate that in a way that makes sense. That has never been done. I'm not going to go into the details, but three or four different departments underneath the governor are in charge of water quality, water quantity, water protection issues, and it gets tough to try to deal with it politically. 90% of the water in Kansas is used out west for irrigation and stock watering. And the irrigation isn't for food, it's for corn that goes into ethanol, into growing beef cattle, into making high fructose corn syrup. And we see depletion being a real issue out there, where quantity of water is more important, really, than quality. But the irony, of course, is that water flows downhill, and downhill tends to be towards eastern Kansas, and people in eastern Kansas are far more worried about water quality because we have to drink what comes out of the CAFOs, off of the row crop fields, out of wastewater treatment, and also all the way from the Missouri watershed. I didn't put a watershed picture in, and maybe might did. It's a huge part of the U.S. that we live in the midst of. There are the equity issues. As I said, as a league member and as also someone who works on environmental justice, I think we need to recognize that the wealthy can afford access to clean water. We flush our toilets with drinking water. We wash our cars with drinking water. We water our lawns and we clean our driveways out of the hoses with drinking water. When people across the globe die of diseases related to not having drinking water. And ask yourself how <coughs> equitable is that? Um, in some of our own cities where um, the infrastructure is crumbling due to the age of the city. That's not a problem we have in Johnson County, particularly. 
but in Cleveland, in Boston, there are people who cannot afford their water bills anymore because of the problem with aging infrastructure. Low-income communities, minority communities primarily, who may have water bills up to $5,000 because of leakage in pipe systems. And the answer has been, cut off their water if they can't pay. This is a real issue in equity and human rights issues. And I, you know, in Johnson County, I, this is one of my phrases, water tends to be underpriced. And Mike will tell you how much a, a penny will buy of water, and it's amazing. Um, and we undervalue it. We waste it. We use it badly. And I think that's something we can all do better on. Even though water conservation in our particular part of the country is not a huge issue, and he'll talk to that, I'm sure. So how do we make sure that we have access to safe and affordable water? Here are some of the issues. We have to have an adequate source of water. And as Mike is going to point out, Water One is, is well-placed geographically to have lots of water available. Where we live at the confluence of the Missouri and the Caw is, is to our benefit. We have to be aware of the contaminants that are in the source water. As I said, if you look at a map of the watershed of the Missouri and the Mississippi, it's this huge funnel that goes from Canada up the Ohio River all the way to New Orleans. It's a huge funnel that represents our, our watershed. We have to have systems that provide proper treatment and disinfection. I'll leave that to Mike to explain how that's done. We have to have a, a system of distribution that is properly maintained. And again, that falls in his, his bailiwick, got to give that to him. And unfortunately, his, his system stops where the water comes towards your house. So we have to have houses that have piping that is appropriate and well maintained as well. And all of this contributes to the question of water affordability. Is it cheap enough that everyone has access? And how do we educate the public to protect water quality and to use water appropriately? Um, here are some of the issues that we are dealing with in Sierra Club with how we protect water at its source. And I'm not going to dive in deeply, but right now our water, our wastewater treatment facilities aren't really ready to deal with the onslaught of chemicals, pharmaceuticals that we put down our toilets and sinks. They were never designed to do that. And then I think Mike will also have an opportunity to tell you why Water One is going in some different directions right now because of some of these questions. We have to deal with industrial mining, human and animal waste. All contribute to pollution. In Kansas, because agriculture is such a huge part of our economy, the ag runoff poses real problems to water quality. Um, it can be the herbicides that are used, and that might be the, the, the glyphosate, pesticides, um, fertilizers, the sediments that run off of the fields, also they, they fill up our reservoirs, and that limits water sources actually. Urban runoff, we're not innocent. We have chemicals that come off of our yards, oil and gas come off our driveways where cars leak. We have de-icing issues. Those salts that run off into our waterways are becoming a real problem in water. Um, Waste that are, and this is something from the fracking study, waste that are injected underground um, with these deep disposal wells as well as fracking fluids that are used in the actual drilling can contaminate uh, groundwater. Combined sewage overflow, this is what's costing Kansas City, Missouri so much money, is trying to fix a problem where when it rains and stormwater fills up the, the sewer systems, it overflows raw sewage into our waterway. They're called combined sewage overflows, and we have them in the area, not as bad as in along the Ohio River. Issues with copper and lead that may be in the pipes, the solder, the pipes in your own house, and there are standards for that um, set by the government, but again, those standards are tested at the, at the water utility, not at your tap, so difference there. And there are naturally occurring substances, for those who've forgotten your basic chemistry, AS is arsenic. Arsenic is something that is in our, our soils in Kansas, and it actually gets into the source water. And You read your report from Water One, you'll see they address arsenic. Um, HABs, that's another idea. That's those are harmful algal blooms. That's the marine ecologist speaking. We have more and more of these algal blooms happening across the nation, red tides in Florida, green scum that we see on our lakes and rivers. They make um, naturally occurring toxins and 
you're told keep your doggy out, don't drink it. So what is going on with us here in Kansas particularly? <coughs> excess nutrients I mentioned, and by the way, those excess nutrients make the algal blooms worse. Uh, most of our lakes are what we call phosphorus limited. So the phosphate in the, in the wastewater triggers these blooms. In the Gulf of Mexico, the dead zone is more a nitrate issue. I'll make one statement about the marine environment there. Herbicides and pesticides. Atrazine is something we look at as a seasonal problem. It's applied to cornfields. The glyphosate, um, interestingly enough, may actually break down. We have some evidence it breaks down and releases more phosphorus and nitrogen into the system. So it isn't just the herbicide effect and possible carcinogenicity. Uh, it's also the nutrients. Coliform bacteria, a lot of our streams, most of them have, have problems with bacteria. It comes from human waste, it comes from bird waste, and fish waste, and dog waste, and cow waste. All contribute to coliforms. Um, these toxic algal blooms are happening more and more, and part of that is climate change. There are some new contaminants of concern. I just attended a, a meeting yesterday at KDHE on these PFAS. You're seeing it in the paper. They are per- and polyfluoral alkyl substances that are found in firefighting foam in your Teflon skillets. And there's more and more evidence that they are, are harmful to human health and they are contaminating water everywhere. The big um, fires that have happened in the Houston chemical industry, they put tons of this AFFF foam on to put fires out and all that's gonna be going into water and groundwater too. And that's where the PFAS come from. We have to change that. Reusing wastewater is an emerging issue. Sierra Club is going to have a nationwide call on this soon um, because if, when water is scarce, we can't afford to just get rid of it, put it down wells. We have to find ways of reclaiming, reusing, and that may mean out of your tap as well. There's certainly a large dick factor there, and we have to deal with that. Um, global warming and climate change, I was asked to at least talk about why that's a problem. Rising temperatures cause more evaporation, which leads to severity of droughts and wildfires. What happens after that, when it rains, is we get flooding and sediment going into our rivers and creeks. Sediment carries phosphorus, arsenic, into our water sources. Stronger storms can lead to changes in snowpack, and well, that's important because it leads to seasonal changes in water availability downstream as the snow melts. The Platte River, for instance, is very dependent on snowpack in the Rockies. Heavier rain events cause flooding, runoff from fields, runoff from streams, um, and leads more pollution. The more evaporation on land, we have dropping water tables. This is important to me as an ecologist. Where the water table intersects a stream <coughs> bed or river bed is where you get flow, and that's called your base flow. As the water table drops, the stream essentially starts drying up at its headwaters. And we're already losing about a third of Kansas streams, headwater streams, due to drying up as a water table, the Ogallala, drops. Um, fewer wetlands. A lot of our wetlands in Kansas are isolated wetlands. They are fed by groundwater. They're not water coming in over the surface. These wetlands are important to habitat. They cleanse water. They recharge groundwater. They slow the runoff and reduce flooding. We're losing our wetlands through this process. There are more paths, these uh, more biotoxins to deal with, and, and on the coast, rising sea levels actually cause these salt water to get to water sources. We don't have that so much here, but as we draw down our groundwater, we encounter more and more salt at the bottom of our groundwater sources, so it's also a problem. I won't dwell on this. Again, that's kind of my area, but the Safe Drinking Water Act in 1974 uh, started addressing issues of water quality, it does require actions to protect drinking water sources. Um, it does not apply to private wells which serve you know, small numbers of individuals. So if you have your own well, you, know, you, you can't protect it using this law. And it does <coughs> authorize the EPA to set national health-based standards. This is important for drinking water because this is what you see in your report from Water One, and that is set by the Safe Drinking Water Act. An act more important to me is the Clean Water Act. It's a separate act which regulates discharge of pollutants into waters of the U.S. US and I bolded that because we're going to have to come back to that. It's abbreviated WOTUS, Waters of the U.S. And the, this act, you can enforce numerical surface water quality standards. And it, the intent of Congress 
and it's written into the preamble, is to restore and maintain chemical, physical, and biological integrity of our nation's waters. That's part of the law and the intent of Congress. We often say we want to keep our water fishable, swimmable, and drinkable. So what is voted? Because this is what my talk really hinges on. If you're going to apply the law, you can only apply the Protective Clean Water Act to waters that fall under jurisdiction of that law. And it's determined by the definition what constitutes the water of the U.S. You'd think we would get that, but we haven't yet, and it's been four over 40 years. Some of the early attempts to define it were based on navigability, because everyone did commerce on rivers, in harbors, and on the ocean. The problem is that is that navigability by a kayak? Is it a ship? What, what does that really mean? And it, it ended up in the courts, obviously, because that's where you take questions like this. But the courts in the 2000s had several cases that they tried to actually say what mattered as the water of the U.S. And ultimately, they split on the decision, and the Corps and the EPA, ACOE stands for Army Corps of Engineers, were told, go back and fix this because we're tired of dealing with it in the courts. So Obama's administration took many years, by the way, to look at the science, consult with people, a lot of public participation in this process, and came up with a 2015 rule that we, we like to call the clean water rule. Um, well, at three, there were people who didn't like that, and including the state of Kansas, which was one of the states that filed suit to halt the law. There are about 11, 12 states that did that. So it was held up in court. Recently, there's been a ruling that the states that did not file suit could go ahead and implement the rule. It has been adopted. It's gone through the process. It's an adopted rule. But the Trump administration is currently trying to redefine what constitutes waters of the U.S. And that's through an executive order that he signed saying, please do this. Um, here are some of the quick and dirty impacts of changing the definition. We predict that we will lose about 20% of headwater streams and tributaries um, to protection. That means if the stream is dry and the cow poops in it, it doesn't matter if it rains later and the poop washes down. It's not a jurisdictional stream, so you don't apply water quality standards. 50% of wetlands will lose protection. In Kansas, probably more. Because what they're saying is that if the wetland isn't adjacent to a navigable water, duh again, um, it won't be protected. So in Kansas, think Cheyenne Bottoms and Kuvira National Wildlife Refuge. If you've visited those, those are sinks. They are isolated wetlands of huge importance to migratory waterfowl and to the economy out there. Tourism, duck hunting. Yeah, they shoot them. It's okay. It's what they do. Um, so we're likely to see more loss in the arid west. Fewer stream miles nationwide will require protection by the states. You know, the states have delegation to protect their waterways pretty much across the board. And the loss of wetland functions, whether it's habitat, recharge, flood retention, water purification, and potentially increased costs to treat your drinking water. There's more you're going to have to get out to meet the standards under the Clean Water Act, and under the Safe Drinking Water Act. So, we have, again, I apologize, this was copied, and I have these um, addresses on a piece of paper back at the Sierra Club table. Um, there was only a single public hearing on this proposed new definition. There were multiple hearings under the Obama administration, and something like a, a year to comment. We've got 60 days to comment on this proposal. One public hearing, which we held in, in Kansas City, Kansas. Um, that hearing, the, the comment period, closes on April 15th. I am running a workshop tomorrow at the Central Resources Library's Learning Lab. You want some help writing comments, I'll give you talking points and I'll push the buttons on the computer for you. We can make this happen, but we have to do it by the 15th of April. You can submit comments yourself online. You need to go to regulations.gov and the comment, and I actually have that address on this piece of paper too. What we like to see is an opportunity for you to tell your own story, why clean water is important to you. And we may work with Ellen to submit formal comment from the league. I think that's being determined at the next board meeting. Yes. So I, I hope there will be something. And, and Mike and I don't necessarily agree on this particular issue, and I'll let him talk to you about that. 
By the way, KDHE, and this has apparently our, our health, Department of Health and Environment, has pretty much said this is okay with them, with the Trump administration's change. I will say that the, the advisory body to Kansas Parks and Wildlife said, no, we don't think it's okay. I'm not sure what formal position one Brad Loveless will take. He's in between a rock and a hard place, and I don't envy him on that. So, here are some major points. Sierra Club would like to see a broad definition of what constitutes the waters of the U.S. based on science, not on the needs of developers, golf course builders, and the oil and gas industry. We need it because it protects our water quality, because it protects wildlife habitat. We encourage watershed-based best management practices for storm water control, both in urban and rural communities. We think protective water quality standards need to be extended up into tributaries. Water flows downhill all the way to eastern Kansas, and we drink that stuff. So all the way up if possible. Recognize the importance of the services provided by wetlands. Ensure protection for small water utilities. Water One's lucky. They have a good group of, of clients who are willing to pay. They have the money to do it. But there are small rural uh, water utilities, well users who don't have that. And I think the bottom line is we have to support affordability and access to safe water for everyone. And that's why we're here today. And I'm done. No, I think Elaine did a really good job of teeing up a lot of the questions that we ought to be talking about. And at first, I just want to say thank you for inviting us to present here today. This is really a great crowd. It's a great opportunity for us to spread the word about water and to talk about water one. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning. Can everyone hear me in the back? Am I okay? Okay. All right, so as, uh, as Marty said, my name is Mike Armstrong. And I am the general manager of Water One, so I act as a CEO, CEO of the organization. And I'm just going to start off with a little bit of background about Water One because I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the organization. So we are a public water utility. We're a nonprofit, independent uh, entity. We were founded in 1957. Back at that time, there was development in the northeast part of Johnson County. That was a suburb of Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri. That area was served by a small water utility called the Kansas City Suburban Water Company. And they were not doing a good job, and the neighbors in that area got um, dissatisfied with the service that private utility was providing. So they went to Topeka and lobbied the legislature to, to create a regional water utility that could better serve this area and the growth of Johnson County. So that's what really kicked off Water One. So one of the interesting things I think about Water One is we were created by the people for the people. They passed that uh, statute in the early 50s. In 1957 then, we were um, initiated as Water District Number One of Johnson County, and we acquired the assets of that uh, previous uh, private utility and became, uh, we became a, a public entity. So we do operate as a quasi-municipal corporation, which means that we operate basically like a city or county government. Uh, we don't have any taxing authority. We only um, are able to, to uh, finance ourselves through rates and charges. We do have an elected board. We have a seven-member elected board. And uh, Ellen and I have a long history because she probably came to about uh, 100 of our board meetings over the years. So she's... She's witnessed our uh, public meetings and our public board interactions, so if you have any questions about how we operate, you can ask her. Uh, I mentioned that the entity is, uh, I work for the board, so I operate the, the organization as the general manager, and we have about 390 employees currently. One of the things that I think really um, makes, distinguishes Water One from a lot of other public utilities is we operate with a business owner concept which means even though we are a public entity, because we only operate on rates and charges, we really have to operate more like a business than a public entity. And one of the things that I preach to all of our employees is to do things as if it was your own business. You know, just imagine that it was your own business. Would you spend your money on something if you owned the business? So whether we're making decisions on buying fleet, facility design, facility operation, or just day-to-day -day operation, 
we really try to encourage our employees to look at it as if it's a business. And I think that really helps us in a lot of ways because it helps us, it helps us operate more efficiently. So this is our service area. We currently have a service area of about 272 square miles. We serve about 80% of Johnson County. We serve 17 different cities. So obviously Overland Park, Leewood, Lenexa, we go all the way out. To, we serve parts of DeSoto, we serve parts of Spring Hill. So there's 17 different uh, communities that we do serve. We have uh, over 440,000 uh, population that we serve and we have almost 150,000 accounts now. One of the things that um, I think people really take for granted with water utilities is all the in-ground infrastructure that we have to maintain. We have over 2,600 miles of pipe to serve our service area, which to give you an idea is the same distance from New York to Los Angeles. So, you know, a lot of times people look at the water utility as being the treatment plant and the intakes on the river, but we really have a lot of pipe in the ground that we have to maintain. And part of the, uh, part of the challenge of being in the Midwest is we do have a lot of main breaks, and so I'm sure that some of you have probably experienced that. One of the things that we do take pride in is we try to uh, fix a main break within four hours. That's the metric that we strive for. So we have a number of key performance indicators and main breaks are going to happen. But one of the things that we try to look at is try to get those repaired as quickly as possible. Uh, one of the things that um, Elaine I don't think didn't mention is fire protection. Um, so I'm going to pick up on this one. Uh, one, of the, one of our major responsibilities of a public entity, um, as a, of a public water utility, is providing fire protection. We have over 18,000 fire hydrants around the, our service area. We do make a point to maintain those each and every year, so we touch every fire hydrant in our area every year to make sure that there's fire protection. Um, and so that's one of the things that a lot of folks do take for granted. Uh, there was a major fire, I don't know if you remember this, but there was a major fire in 2017 in Oval Park at the City Place Apartments that really <coughs> tested our system and really showed the benefit of having a strong, robust water supply system and distribution system. You know, I've heard of uh, three alarm fires before, but this was actually an eight alarm fire, which was the first one I'd ever heard of, and they actually used... Uh, this thing working okay? Yes, yeah. you're good. Okay. Um, we actually used about 3 million gallons of water within a few hours on that uh, fire. So that's just, it just underscores the importance of having a good fire protection system in our community. So one of the things, uh, Elaine had mentioned how many blessings we have as a community. One of the things that we do have, we have a, uh, we're blessed with a really nice, strong water supply. We have two rivers that are our primary sources, the Kansas River and the Missouri River. So we have an intake on the Kansas River that is just downstream of the 435 bridge. So if you're headed to uh, the Woodland, to uh, the Legends area, it's just uh, to the right and downstream of that 435 bridge. On the Missouri River, we have an intake that is close to Parkville, so we're just across the river from Parkville and upstream a bit. We have an uh, intake on the Missouri River there. And we also have a large collector well in the Wolcott area, uh, which is near the Lakeside Speedway, which is the area just north of uh, uh, the Ledges. So what this means is we have a very robust and complete water supply system, so that if we have a problem with like a chemical spill or water quality problem on one of the rivers, then we have options to switch back and forth for our supplies. Overall, we have um, a supply capacity of over 200 million gallons per day. Our record to date is 157 million gallons, which was uh, served in 2012. So you can see that we're in very good shape as far as our water supply. So this is a picture of our treatment plants. We have two treatment plants that we operate. The first treatment plant is, uh, so on the upper left, is our Wolcott treatment plant, which is located, as I mentioned, just north of the uh, Legends area of the Kansas Speedway. Um, and then the bottom right is our Hanson treatment plant, which is kind of our workhorse treatment plant that has been 
in operation since the 50s, and that's on uh, Holiday Drive just near Lake Quivira. One of the things that Water One really prides ourselves on is our planning, and we have a 40-year master plan. So we look out 40 years in advance to make sure that we have planned for the water treatment, supply, distribution system of this area to make sure that we're here to supply enough water for the growth of our community. Another thing that we're really proud about is our water treatment lab. And Elaine mentioned several issues related to water treatment and our regulations. In 2010, we dedicated a brand new state-of-the-art lab, 20,000 square feet. It is a NELAC certified lab, which means that uh, it's the highest credentials that you can receive as a lab. Uh, in 2018, our folks uh, collected uh, over 14,000 samples and ran over 21,000 tests. And uh, we also talked about the, the Safe Drinking Water Act. One of the things that, that all water utilities are required to do is issue what they call a consumer confidence report. But it's basically a report card. This is the report card that uh, lets you know whether we're doing a good job on treating your water. The Safe Drinking Water Act now has uh, probably over 100 different uh, chemicals and constituents and contaminants that have to be uh, tested and monitored for, and uh, this is the report card that we provide annually to let you know how we're doing, to give you assurance that we're doing a good job. And as Elaine mentioned, uh, we're primarily regulated by EPA. EPA is the one that sets the, the standards and guidelines under the Safe Drinking Water Act, but that is also delegated to the state. So the Kansas Department of Health and Environment is the group that actually does the regulation at a state level. And another group that kind of keeps an eye on us are the, the uh, home brewers because they're also very excited about our water quality. And apparently, I didn't know this before, but there are nine flavor ions that have impact home brewing. And so we have a specific site on our website so that the folks that want to beer, brew their own beer can take a look at that and uh, keep an eye on things uh, that way. So one of the things that we are completely committed to is making sure that our water is safe. And uh, Elaine mentioned several of these issues, and I'm going to uh, drill down on a few of these. Um, the lead and copper testing is something that has really been in the news recently because of the situation in Flint, Michigan. Yes. And I wanted to let you know that uh, we do a lot of additional testing on lead and copper beyond what the regulations are required um, as far as a utility of our size. You're only required to test for lead and copper every three years. We test for it annually. And one of the things that I think a lot of folks don't realize is that the lead and copper, um, particularly the lead, is not really in the source water, it's not in the water that comes from the treatment plant, and it's not in the distribution system. It's within the plumbing and fixtures within the home. And so those tests do take place at the tap in the home. Uh, because you have to, uh, there's a very complex system that you have to go through to take those tests, but the problem occurs is if you don't, if you have a water that is corrosive and is delivered to a home, uh, the, corrosive, the corrosive water then leaches the lead into the water that the consumers are going to consume at the home. So the important part is to have a really strong corrosion control program to make sure that the, that the water that you're delivering is not corrosive. And that's one of the things that Water One has been very proactive on and we have a very strong corrosion control program because what you want is to have water that's slightly depositing versus being corrosive and so that's something that we put a lot of effort in. Atrazine testing and treatment is not also a big issue um, you know in the Midwest you're really stuck with the water source that you have and occasionally we do have atrazine in our water we do test for atrazine much more frequently than what's required I think the federal regs only require that to be tested quarterly and reported on a quarterly running average. We test for that uh, much, much more frequently, especially during the seasons when we think atrazine will be running off. 
We test for atrazine several times a week during that period. Um, and uh, we have been on top of atrazine for years. We actually participated in a class action suit uh, against the manufacturer of atrazine, Syngenta, uh, a few years ago. And on your behalf, we received a settlement of about uh, $660,000, which was intended to offset the cost of additional treatment that we had to do uh, because of the atrazine in our water. Uh, some other areas that I want to mention about additional periodic testing for EPA. Um, every five years, EPA comes out with a list of uh, contaminants that they think might be a problem. And it's called, uh, this process is called the Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule, UMC, UCMR. And so we're on uh, the fourth round of that testing. And so every five years, EPA identifies about 30 different contaminants or problems that they want you to uh, monitor for during that time period. And we're currently finishing up the fourth, uh, the fourth uh, version of that. And I um, also wanted to touch on a couple of things that um, Elaine had mentioned. As far as PFAS and PFAS, that is a concern in some areas. Under the uh, UCMR4, UCMR3, uh, collection rules, we did test for that in our water and did not find any, uh, either PFAS or PFAS, PFAS or PFAS, which is good news. These things are just so prevalent in the, in the environment that it's kind of scary. She mentioned it's in Teflon, it's in your Teflon skillets, it's a major component in Scotchgard uh, 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 fabric protector, it's in the carpet here because of the um, the stain resistance and the flame retardant, so it's really all over. So it is kind of scary, but the good news is we do not have any in our water supply. So I also want to talk a little bit about the, the Missouri River bed degradation issue. So we're really blessed to have a good supply of water, but one of the challenges that we have is the Missouri River bed has been degrading. It's been down cutting, which affects our ability to withdraw water out of our intake. So we have been working with the Corps of Engineers over the past 15 years or so to study this problem. And uh, about a year and a half ago, they came out with a technical report, which was the completion of that study, that determined that the problem with the riverbed degradation is sand dredging on the Missouri River. And so I would like to have your help in addressing this issue. I was actually in... Uh, Washington last week, talking with the Corps of Engineers about this issue. Sand dredging permits are reauthorized every five years. And their next uh, reauthorization is coming up in 2020. Uh, the last time these permits were uh, processed, we did ask for a public meeting on this issue and a public hearing on whether the sand dredging uh, should continue. And really the question is, do you want cheap sand and gravel out of the river or do you want to have a healthy river. And so um, we talked to the Corps of Engineers about that and they said, well, people don't want to come to public meetings. We've had public meetings in the past and no one shows up. And we don't think that it would really be valuable for us to have a public meeting on this issue. So I have a sign-up sheet that if anyone <laughs> would like to sign up to attend a public meeting on sand dredging on the Missouri River, I'm going to collect a list of names and email addresses and supply those to the Corps of Engineers. So I'm going to pass this around today. So this is really, it is, it's an issue that really faces the, this whole stretch of the Missouri River, the Kansas City stretch, all the way up to like St. Joe at this point. And it's a major issue that we really could use your help on. One of the things that Water One really feels strongly about is getting involved in the uh, policy issues and uh, trying to make the, all the water policies uh, better and more efficient for the state. Uh, we've done that uh, through various uh, participations. Um, Marty mentioned that I'm on the Kansas Water Authority. I represent the Speaker of the House on that group. Um, we also have staff members that are on the Kansas and Missouri River Basin Advisory Committees. Um, he also mentioned my uh, participation in Mr. Rick to help develop a management plan for the Missouri River. I've been on that group since 2007. 
And then finally, I think most importantly, we were heavily involved in the development of the 50-year water vision that was created for the state of Kansas. And when that document first came out, the first draft did not include any provisions for water quality. It was, uh, it was entirely focused on water quantity. And so we fought hard, um, both behind the scenes and in uh, public settings, to make sure that water quality was included in that document. And I'm happy to say that, uh, I would say about half of the focus of the water vision is on water quality now. And that was something that we put a lot of effort into. And so we're really happy that that, uh, that was successful. So uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, Elaine did spend a lot of time on is source water quality and harmful algae blooms. <clears throat> and we have had a problem with harmful algae blooms, uh, particularly on Milford Reservoir. <coughs> Starting back in 2011, um, there started to be some very severe uh, harmful algae blooms on Milford Reservoir. And they were so bad that if your dog went and drank out of the, the reservoir, they would just keel over dead. Um, the harmful algae blooms, there's really two problems with them. They create a lot of uh, taste and odor problems that are difficult to treat for, but they also create a toxin. There's an algae toxin that is created by some of these harmful algae blooms. Uh, and the main one here that we're worried about is microcystin, which is a hepatoxin, which actually uh, affects your liver. And so uh, the thing that I want to, I guess, the takeaway from this slide that I want to to leave with you is there is a direct connection between smart, efficient farming practices and source water quality. And so um, recognizing that, we decided to work uh, cooperatively with the farmers, with the producers in the Milford watershed to try to fix this problem. So we're involved in uh, what I think is a totally innovative new program for this area. Um, it's a program called RCPP, which stands for the Regional Conservation Partnership uh, Program. This is administered out of the NRCS, and it's part of the Farm Bill. It's part of the, the Department of Agriculture budget. And so basically what it does is we've, we've brought together 30 stakeholders uh, in, the, in the region, all over the region, including water utilities up and down the Kansas uh, River, to work with the farmers in that area to try to reduce the phosphorus runoff. Because the problem with Milford Reservoir is there's excess phosphorus running off from the watershed above the reservoir. Um, and one of the things you really have to think about is the reservoir doesn't, doesn't start at the, at the edge of the reservoir. It, it really starts way up in the, um, in the watershed, uh, which is the point that uh, Elaine made. And so what this regional uh, conservation partnership program is consisted of is we apply to the uh, NRCS for a grant. We received $2.88 million, which is matched with local funding. So the total uh, cost of this project is about $6 million over a five-year period. Water One is contributing $100,000 plus a lot of uh, in-kind work. So if you're interested, take a look at this website, milfordwatershed.org, and our communication staff created that website, and pretty much all the communications that you see about this program is something that uh, came out of Water One Shop. And so uh, the purpose of this program is to reduce harmful algae blooms, which will improve our water quality long term. So it's something that we're very excited about. I think it's a great program, and I would really encourage you to look at this website and get involved if you can. Okay, uh, so I was also asked to talk a, little, talk a little bit about sustainability. And sustainability, like a lot of things, can have a thousand definitions. This is kind of the definition that Water One has used, which is basically the triple bottom line. You look for the intersection between the social, environmental, and economic aspects of a question. And uh, a couple of the programs that we have uh, uh, been pursuing that I think really demonstrate our um, commitment to sustainability is our new ozone treatment facility. So we, as Elaine mentioned, we are changing our primary disinfection and treatment process at our Hanson plant. 
Right now we use chlorine dioxide and powder activated carbon. Uh, and we're switching to ozone, which is a, a very powerful oxidant. And one of the things that is most notable about the ozone, I think, is that it does protect us from those harmful algae blooms, the microcystins, and would also protect us from the emerging contaminants that uh, Elaine mentioned in the wastewater stream. Things like endocrine disruptor uh, compounds and that sort of thing. And that, uh, that project is about a $40 million project. It's under uh, construction now. The first phase will go into operation this summer and uh, it will be completed next year. Uh, the other thing is we're working on a hydropower uh, facility on the Kansas River. I mentioned that we have an intake on the Kansas River, uh, which is just downstream from the 435 bridge. If you take a look, there is a waterfall there. And it's very similar to the waterfall that occurs in the city of Lawrence. There's been a hydropower uh, facility there since the 1840s, I believe, Bowersock. So uh, we've looked at that as an opportunity for us to build a, a small hydropower project on the Kansas River that would provide electricity to Water One's operations. And so that's something that we've been working on for the last couple of years. And our board is set this week. Um, to actually vote to include that in our long-term master plan. And so we're very excited about that project. And then I'm not, I think I'm running probably low on time here, but um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but um, there are a lot of things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis to try to promote sustainability. One of them is our peak management rate. So we have a two-block rate system that actually charges more money the more you use. So. Uh, it sort of penalizes or uh, creates a more equitable distribution of our uh, cost structure. If you use more water in the summer, you pay a higher rate. Um, let's see, energy management is another big issue, I think, that is facing both water and wastewater utilities. We have a huge power bill. Uh, we have about a $115, $120 million budget, and of that, we spend about $8 million a year on power. So that's one of our most important um, operational uh, issues, and so we do. We have a lot of programs to try to manage our power demands and our uh, power consumption. One of the things that we are looking at is uh, some of the new programs that Kansas City Power and Light uh, has out to uh, make a commitment to renewable energy sources. So that's one of the things that we're investigating currently as part of our management of our energy. Um, and I also wanted to mention our peak management, our peak uh, saving, shaving natural gas generators. At our Wolcott plant, we, um, we installed generators to provide for emergency backup. Uh, but rather than installing diesel generators where we would just use them on a very uh, limited basis, we actually installed natural gas turbine generators, which allows us to shave our peaks during the summer. And so during the summer, we only use about half of the power that we need from our uh, uh, water, from our uh, energy utility, the Board of Public Utilities. The rest of it we create on our own with our gas turbine generators, which really allows us to, to shave those peaks to have a much more efficient energy use, and it reduces our cost as well. You gave me a long list of things to cover here. I don't know. Set you up. So, um, <laughs> Affordability, of course, is something that uh, a lot of folks are also interested in discussing these days. Uh, been a lot of uh, discussion in the news about it. Again, it's like sustainability. One of the hardest things to determine is how do you define what is affordable? And uh, so what we really struggled with is uh, when you look at an area like Johnson County with a, such a high uh, median household income, I think the, the median household income in Johnson County is about... Uh, $80,000 a year. Um, that's really not a good benchmark for affordability. And so what we, and, and most, uh, most of the measures, most of the metrics and benchmarks on affordability really are based upon that median household income. And we just didn't think that, that was a good measure. The other thing that it usually looks at is a typical customer bill. Like what's your average customer using? Again, uh, Johns County is not average in terms of water usage because uh, a lot of people do use water to irrigate their grass. Um, so we looked at, we're, we really tried to identify a different metric to, uh, to gauge affordability. So what we're using now is we're looking at the 20th percentile to try to identify um, 
what is affordable instead of using that median household income, we're using the 20th percentile, which I think is about $3,000 a month income around there. And then also, rather than looking at our average bill or our typical bill, we're also looking at how much would that customer use for indoor water usage. If you're just looking at what is the minimum water that someone would use if they were at the lower end of the economic scale, what is that amount? And so when we do that, it shows that our bill for the purposes of affordability is about $20 a month. And of that uh, $3,000 or so, after you take away the uh, essential uh, <coughs> expenses like housing, health care, um, those kind of things, uh, it leaves about three to $400 to pay things like utility bills. And of that amount, um, we're about 3% of their dis disposable income. So that is the metric that we're using for affordability. We do think we're an affordable utility, but one of the things that we want to make sure is that we continue to maintain that moving forward. And so by having a metric like this, uh, we're going to keep it uh, front and center with our board. And then as far as uh, sustaining affordability long term, uh, some of these are just pretty much common sense, I think. Uh, good stewardship, I mentioned that we try to encourage our uh, employees to act uh, you know, as if it was their own money and, and to operate our business with a frugal mindset. And I think that that's, um, that's important. But we do have that inclining block rate that will uh, help maintain affordability. Uh, and we have a common sense approach with customers. Uh, Elaine mentioned that there's a lot of utilities that have gotten a black eye because they let customers get behind on their water bills and then they went and cut them off. And then th there's a big controversy that, that uh, really comes about by that because then you get this question like, oh, the big bad water utility now has cut their customers off. We have, uh, we have a great uh, uh, staff in that area and we do try to work with customers to make payment arrangements, if something comes up, we are very proactive on that. And we have a, a fairly low uh, percentage of disconnects. We have uh, less than 1% of our customers get disconnected for non-payment. And then finally, I want to mention that we do support uh, the Johnson County Utility Assistance. This is for folks that can't afford to pay their water bills. There's actually a fund available uh, through this, uh, the county for uh, people that need help with their utility bills. We use uh, part of the money that we receive through our relationship with HomeServe, the service line protection company um, that uh, provides services to our service area. We take that money and donate it to the uh, Johnson County Utility Assistance for, uh, to help those folks out. Uh, just want to mention the program that we have, I Love Tap. I, one of the things that ticks me off the most is when I go to the store and I see all these people buying bottled water. These giant carts full of bottled water. Uh, I think it's wasteful. I think it's not sustainable. It's not good for the environment. It's just not a good idea. And so we have a, a really good program. Again, if you look at ilovecap.org, you can see the, uh, the details. Uh, we've given out these uh, reusable water bottles that have on the table. I love tap. We've uh, to date we've handed out over 4,000 of those bottles, and it just keeps an uh, an amazing amount of plastic bottles out of the landfill or out of our environment. We also have we're also proud of our school outreach. Uh, we have a great program. We've uh, been able to make contact with 40 percent of the sixth graders in the Blue Valley and Shawnee Mission School Districts. We think it's important to try to uh, impact folks uh, when they're young. And uh, we've had a great uh, opportunity with those sixth grade classes and get a lot of great feedback. And then I want to mention, coming up, we have a 5K run, which we call our Tower to Tower 5K. It's on May 4th. This is a fundraiser for Water for People. So this uh, feeds in directly to what uh, Lane was saying about people in areas of the world that don't have access to clean, healthy water, particularly folks that have to carry water over a long period of time, long distance. And so um, this is a fundraising uh, or, uh, uh, event, and we have raised over $30,000 over the last couple years and donated that to Water for People, and uh, we do uh, uh, solicit sponsorships, so almost all of the registration 
for this event um, goes towards Water for People. And so again, the website uh, there is tower5k.org. So I would encourage you to sign up. And you don't have to be a runner, because I'm a walker, so you don't have to <laughs> run. Uh, and it's a great event if you want to come out. There's also a lot of really interesting informational tables and information uh, provided as part of that event. One minute. One minute. <laughs> I'm actually done. Just be, as I'm going through, there are quite a number of cards here, and I and I know that we'll not always be able to get to all of them, but I really thank you for. Uh, for submitting them. We'll try to do our best, but while I'm kind of collating and curating these, if you wouldn't mind, we kind of talked about the impact of these floods, and I thought perhaps maybe while we're, while I'm looking at this, you two could maybe work hey, through Marty. that. I have a, oh, Marty, Marty, Marty. I have a couple of pictures <coughs> on the flood. Oh, can we get that back up? Sure. <clears throat> you want to go first? I think they care more about their water. Than okay, all right. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the flooding is a good, it's really a good question. We have had a lot of um, challenges with flooding over the years. And I actually have a couple of pictures, a couple of slides. I'll let this fine. Oh, you were right, right here. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me run through these real quick. So, is there a specific question on the flooding? Well, water quality and quantity. It's water. We had plenty of water quantity. Yeah. There was no shortage of quantity. So um, one of the things that uh, you know we've been lucky. A lot of times I say that we stand on our shoulders of giants because the folks that came before me at Water One were very proactive and very prudent about how they design our facilities. Our facilities are designed to the 500-year flood level. So we were affected by the flooding, but we didn't, it didn't um, impact our, or our operations. So we dealt with it uh, effectively. So this is a picture, I think I have a, um, so this is a picture of the Missouri River uh, about a week ago. Uh, and, and this is the 435 bridge here. So this is, um, so this is the river right here. So this is where the river is supposed to be, and that's about a 600 feet, six, seven, eight hundred feet channel. Um, so you can see how far the river extended. This is our collector well that we have, our Wolcott collector well, and so it was actually surrounded by floodwaters, and it was designed to be surrounded by floodwaters. This is, this flood was very similar to what happened in 2011. Um, as far as the volume of water and the, the stage of the flooding. The good thing about this flood versus 2011 is the 2011 flood actually lasted for over two months. And this flood came up and dropped down fairly quickly. And so here's a, here's a close-up uh, version of, of our collector well. So now we're looking the opposite direction. So this is the river. So this is the river bank here. And this is our collector well. And you can see that even though it was inundated with floodwaters, there was still about 15 feet of clearance. So we built it high enough that it wouldn't impact us. The thing that's challenging during these periods is, is um, accessing the well for maintenance. So we have a boat, and we also have an amphibious uh, all-terrain vehicle that we use. Uh, because once these floodwaters go down, um, it really leaves a mess. I mean, it's just a mucky mess as soon as the floodwaters go down. So until it really dries out, it's a challenge. You can't use a boat. Um, you have to use some other kind of vehicle to access it. And so uh, Water One was impacted. As far as water quality, we're also blessed with having a wide range of treatment options and chemical feeds. Um, you probably heard some discussion in the news about uh, Kansas City, Missouri being challenged with water quality. Uh, we were lucky. Um, number one, we were not uh, operating our Missouri River intake at the time, so we didn't have to deal with it. Again, it comes back to that idea of having multiple sources and having the convenience of switching from source to source. But 
Kansas City, Missouri uh, doesn't have as many options as we do as far as our treatment processes and treatment chemicals that we can add. We did have a little bit of challenge with this water on the collector well. The collector well actually is, is dug down 100 feet into the bank of the river and there's lateral uh, screen that runs under the river. So we get a really nice pre-treatment, a pre-filtration through this facility. So even though this flood water looks kind of yucky, when it uh, gets drawn down through the river bank and into the collector well laterals, it actually cleans it up a lot. So this facility, uh, we had some challenges, but uh, nothing major. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, you know, what the flood looked like to Water One, and it, there are some challenges, but we were able to, to operate through them effectively. Uh, another question I heard about the flooding is, what caused the flood? Is it going to happen again? Were the Corps of Engineers at fault? Uh, so, were the environmentalists at fault? <laughs> So this is a, I think this is an interesting graphic um, that's created by the Corps of Engineers. And what this shows is the amount of annual runoff from the Missouri River. So the Missouri River, as Elaine mentioned, is a huge drainage basin. It's over 500,000 square miles. It drains one-sixth of the United States. The Missouri River is the longest river in the U.S. This is like the fourth largest drainage basin in the world. The fourth largest drainage basin in the world. So there's a lot of water that comes through the Missouri River. And so what the Corps has kept track of the runoff from the Missouri River uh, back to the 1890s. So they have over 100 years of data. And so what, and the metric here is the runoff above Sioux City, Iowa which the, the, there's six dams on the Missouri River. The last dam is right above Sioux City, Iowa, so that's why they, leave, that's why they use this as a metric. But I think is, what's interesting is if you look at this over time, there are distinct periods of flooding. So what this shows is this is the median runoff on the Missouri River, and that's about 25 million acre feet per year. And so, they keep track of whether it's the upper quartile, upper decile, lower quartile, or lower decile of the, of the data that they keep. And as you can see, there's distinct periods. This is the Dust Bowl. This was a drought during the Dust Bowl period in the 30s. This is the, the big drought that uh, happened in the 50s, which is really kind of the benchmark for planning purposes for um, Kansas. The, the 50s drought was certainly one of the most memorable. But there was also a drought in the 90s and in the 2000s. So one of the things I think is interesting is the first year after the drought in the 90s was 1993. And you can see that it was kind of a bad year as far as runoff, but not as bad as 97 and not as bad as 2011, which is a flood that I mentioned earlier, and um, you know, not as bad as what it was in 2018. So the thing to keep in mind, I think, with these floods is every flood is different, and it depends on where the water comes in. The water that fell by rainfall and snow during this flood really happened in Nebraska. So it came in below Sioux City, Iowa, so the Corps really didn't have an opportunity to catch that water. So the answer to the question, was the Corps at fault? I don't think they were in this situation. I don't think there's anything that the Corps could have done to uh, reduce or minimize this flooding any more than they did. Uh, the best statement that I've seen about this issue is uh, from Tom Waters, who's the Executive Director of the Missouri Levy and Drainage District Association. Tom said you can't put a gallon of water in a quart jar. And I think that that really sums up this flood, because there was just no place for this water to go. There was not a reservoir to catch it. And so I think the court did a good job, and um, they did what they could to respond to this flood. It was just so low in the um, in the watershed that there was no way that they could have managed it any better than they did. And the only thing I would add to that is that we have a, a an agency, the Corps of Engineers, which is tasked with managing this enormous river basin, 
and being responsible to multiple interests. The barge transportation industry has a very powerful lobby and they are partly responsible for what goes on in the riverbed because they, they armor the sides of the river, they dredge the river, they keep it open for very few barges, but they do keep it open. There's the Endangered Species Act, which is why the environmentalists sometimes get dragged into this and set up as a straw man for causing the flooding. But the Corps does have to obey that law and provide habitat for three critically endangered species. There's the compact with the, the recreational users behind the dams all the way up the watershed. Um, there's the flooding issue. There's the, I mean, the core has a really tough job here. Water supply. Pardon? Water supply. Oh, the water supply, yeah. Okay, exactly. Um, but those multiple interests and, and the fact that many of our, our farms are now located in the floodplain and they are, they are supported partly by insurance that we all help pay for, um, we have to rethink the way we manage that river, and as climate change makes these heavy rainfall events more common, that's what the models are telling us, we're going to see probably more flooding. I would say your graph shows that we are seeing an upward trend in these high flow rates. So It's going to be a problem ongoing. We're going to take one break here. We're looking for that petition. We want to make sure it's moving around the room. Thank you very much. And Candy, we need to move on okay. with questions. We're not going to get through all of these, but uh, there's a couple of these about home water. I mean, double checking your home water. You said it comes out of the tab. Where do, uh, where do we get our water tested? What do you recommend? Brita, zero water. You know, what are the kinds of things that you can do to check our own tab? We don't, we don't think you need to have any kind of filtration system on your water. Uh, I wouldn't advise you to buy any of those. I, our water quality is very high, um, and one of the problems, honestly, one of the problems that people have when they put on a filtration system is they don't properly maintain it, and an improperly maintained filter system is one of, that's a health, a health hazard, that's one of the worst things that you can do, because what it does is it, it actually, if there are any contaminants in there, it actually concentrates them and allows them to grow, so personally, I don't have a filtration system. Uh, on my house, I think I have a, you know, one of those screw-in carbon filters on my refrigerator, uh, but you have to change those every six months. Uh, I don't think a filtration system is warranted or necessary, so I'm not going to endorse any of those. I concur. Okay. Um, here's a, they're kind of related. Are water services 100% tax refunded, and how do businesses and people, regular individuals, pay the same rate? Now, we're really talking about what's the, you know, they're really talking about the impact of businesses and that kind of thing. So, can you read the question again? Uh, well, there are three of them, okay. but uh, are water services 100% tax refunded? Do people and businesses pay the same rates for water usage, and do we... How do you expand new homes and treatment facilities for the new the new sources, the users of water? Okay, I think I get it. I know that's tough. So uh, the answer to the first question is 100% uh, funded by fees and charges. There is no tax uh, involved in our water service. Uh, businesses and homes do pay the same rate on a volume basis. It depends on what size of a meter you have as far as your service charge. So, you know, a, a 5 8 inch uh, meter, which is the smallest meter, pays about $11 a month. And as you go up in size, the meter cost um, increases. So if you have a large meter, you pay a high, higher um, uh, service charge on a monthly basis. But as far as the volume of water, the volumetric charge is the same for uh, residential and business customers. Uh, as far as development, um, our board has always had a very strong commitment to growth base for growth. And so if you're going to build a new subdivision, you're required to extend, to pay for the cost for extending the water mains out to that subdivision and all the mains within the subdivision itself. In addition, we charge a connection fee, which is called a system development charge. Right now, that's about $5,000. And that's basically a buy-in to our system so it's like an you buy an equity position into the into the utility, um, and that covers the cost of uh, water uh, supply, treatment, and uh, major transmission mains to get the water into the 
service area, which includes uh, pump stations and that sort of thing. So the $5,000 or so service charge, or system development charge, recovers the total cost that we spent for those facilities. Okay, here are a couple that are kind of related. Does yard debris, leaves, grass, and all that stuff blown out to the street make any difference in our water quality? And if it does, how do we help owners under, homeowners understand that? And then is it politically and economically feasible for what I want to do more to encourage water conservation, uh, like, you know, use of gray water for golf courses, uh, water-saving toilet promotions, etc. So these are kind of what can we do as consumers, uh, and what can you do to help us be better consumers of water? Right, the leaves and debris that go down your storm drain. Actually, the, it's the next city down the pipe that has to deal with the organics that are in their source water. So yes, the chemicals that go down the storm drain, the salt that goes down the storm drain, probably isn't going to impact Water One very much because we're downstream of our own sewage. There's been, you know, philosophy that we ought to put our sewer plants above our water intakes and then we would do a lot better with keeping water clean. Um, so, yeah, it's good practice, it's the best management practice for protecting the quality of water in our streams, whether it's for drinking or whether it's for wildlife. Um, so the, okay, go ahead. The other question was related to water conservation? Yeah, I mean, it does it help, does water one do, what do they do to help uh, right. consumers uh, be better water consumers. Okay. Well, generally when we think about water conservation, it's in water scarce areas where there's really, you know, where there's a uh, limited supply. One of the things that we're blessed with in this area, it, as you saw from that uh, earlier slide, is we have a lot of water supply and it, we're really blessed with having a very strong, uh, reasonably priced water supply. So in terms of water reuse, things like uh, gray water reuse, uh, we've looked at that feasibility and it really, uh, it really doesn't uh, cost out as far as using uh, gray water in this area because we have such a plentiful uh, supply of fresh water. Uh, as far as water conservation, one of the things that we've been trying to advocate is to have people use water more efficiently. And we have a program called Smart Watering because we've had problems in the past with people setting their irrigation systems to operate Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So when that happens, we have plenty of water to supply during those periods, but it does put stress on our facilities. And it does drive up our electrical costs because we pay electricity based upon peak demand during certain periods. And so what we've tried to encourage people to do is to use as much water as they need, use it responsibly, but then also adopt a schedule where if you're an even-numbered house, go ahead and use it on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. If you're an odd-numbered house, use it on Tuesday, Thursday, and the weekend. That will help us um, kind of spread out our water usage. Our water demands would be more uh, steady. It would put less uh, um, stress and demand on our system, and it would just be much more efficient. So that's what we've been focused on over the last couple of years is what we call smart watering to try to even out the usage to make it more efficient. Uh, I know we don't have a lot of time, and so three minutes or three questions? Three minutes. Three minutes, okay. Um, so one of them is, how do you dispose of contaminants that you do take out of the water? And then finally, um, one of the things that, I mean, are, is the EPA doing enough to, to protect our water quality? I'll take the first one. Yeah. I'll take the second one. Okay. So, um, Luckily, we don't have a lot of contaminants that we do take out of the water. Um, we have a multi-barrier treatment process that includes uh, sand filtration, and we do soften the water. So, you know, we do have kind of hard water here, and we do a partial softening. We use um, uh, lime to uh, do the water softening, and the lime, and we also add uh, powder-activated carbon, so the lime residuals and the powder activated carbon that comes out of our treatment process is piped down to monofills, which are in the um, Kansas River um, Basin or the Missouri River Basin. These areas are, are right around our well fields, and so we uh, maintain these monofills. So it's a, it's a totally harmless, inert uh, lime <coughs> residual 
that uh, we uh, pipe into these monofills. And um, so what we do is we buy the land, dig a monofill, deposit this lime residual, and then we cap that over so that that land can be farmed in the future. So that's that's pretty much what we do with the um, with the materials that we re uh, remove from the drinking water. As far as EPA's um, being active in protecting water quality, I mean they are they are uh, having to follow the law, the Safe Drinking Water Act or, or the Clean Water Act. In theory, there is much less enforcement generally going on with the EPA right now, and the. The environmental community does have concerns about this PFAS issue. It has been under study for some time. The Center for Disease Control has set lower standards for drinking water exposure, but there is no standard in place yet, quite frankly, of maximum contamination level. I don't think, in fact, that EPA has created any new drinking water standards since, what, 1996 hasn't added anything? Officially, uh, they that they, us, that's enforceable. They gave us a health advisory on microsystem. A health advisory. These are non-enforceable. Uh, and and, and a, applause to Water One for doing more testing and for reporting out on anything they detect. I mean, I think we have a very good water utility. That's why we're teaming up here today. Um, but yeah, there could probably be more aggressive. The, the action plan for PFAS is really a note to that they intend to take action. It's not an action plan, in my opinion. I don't know about you, but this is so science wonderful. It just makes us feel so proud of our people. Many of you joined the league because of your environmental concerns, and it's really beautiful that um, Marty and Marcia have been able to take it. There are two? Okay, real quick. Quickly, someone said they wanted more on the workshop tomorrow. I have a, a handout in the back that has that information on it. There are two sessions, so come see me at the Sierra Club table. Okay, there was a question about... Um, if someone's interested in the dredging issue but don't uh, want to go to a meeting, who should they contact? <laughs> and you can send me an email. Uh, send me an email and I'll, I'll put you in contact with uh, the process that you need to uh, to be involved with on the dredging issue. Ladies and gentlemen. Can I do one thing before yes. we yes. finish up? I want to introduce uh, two of our staff that is here in the audience. Mandy Cobby, who is our Director of <laughs> Customer Relations, <laughs> and Michelle Worth. This is the lady that makes the water. So, if you have any, so if you have any questions, any detailed questions about the water chemistry, testing, anything like that, Michelle is the person to talk to. I know enough about this to be dangerous, so she's the one that bails me out. When I get things wrong, and I'm sure she's probably going to tell me I've messed up some of these things. But um, I wanted to thank them for coming out on a Saturday to support us. We also have a table back here with uh, additional information and uh, little coasters to use in your car uh, console. So uh, we don't want to carry them home, so please take them.